Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Book 1 of Cicero's On the Nature of the Gods, one central line of criticism against the Epicurean position that Valeus has just put forward is going to concern the atoms. And you might say, well, what is all that about? So one interesting feature of the Epicurean position, the philosophy, the school, was that they were atomists. And atom isn't exactly what we typically think of in our science classes and textbooks today because we have subatomic particles. Atom literally means the smallest building block of stuff, what you cannot cut you know, ah, privative, to main, cut, the, the smallest thing that you can't break down any further. And the Epicureans inherited this from Democritus and Leucippus, and they made great use of it in their philosophy. So Coda is going to say that the Epicureans, as he says, make great use, make significant use of, and it's translated, I like this, lawless domination of the atoms. And, you know, this is going to cause some troubles, as we're going to see. Uh, the Latin for this is ab uteris, so you make use of ad omnia atomorum regno et uh, licentia, right? So licentia, uh, license we get from that, a sort of unruliness, right? And the Epicureans actually did think that the atoms moved at random. There wasn't any grand plan or design or anything. They did what they did, falling in the void every once in a while, having a swerve into each other. And so he tells uh, everybody, well, you construct and you create. The uh, terms there are ethingis atque ethicis, right? You, you cause everything out of the atom. So that would include God, but also includes, as he's going to say a little bit later, uh, you said that heaven and earth were created from these. And, you know, heaven and earth, meaning the what we see in front of us here, and the heavens where the gods are presumed to exist. Even if there's other earths, other worlds, they're all made up of the same thing. So, what do we have here? He, he says, you know, I don't actually think that these atoms exist, but you say that they do. So there's certain minute or tiny or light particles, uh, some of which are smooth, levia, some of which are rough, aspera, some of which are round, some of which are angular, some curved, some hook shaped. So they've all got different like characteristics to them, none of which we can actually observe. These are just sort of what the Epicureans say must be the case. And everything winds up being generated out of these. And so he goes on and he says that everything is created from these or brought into being from these, not by any compulsion of nature. So there's no law, there's no necessary mind or regularity behind it, but only by, as he's going to say, a kind of accidental colliding. Concursu quodam forti, uh, fortituio, right? So it's, uh, you know, there's no design, there's just randomness happening. And, and that's as far as we can get. So, okay, 
that's what the Epicureans believed. Why is this going to be a problem for a theology, for a doctrine of the gods? Well, how the hell do you get gods from that? Right? You can say, well, you know, randomness, everything that's going to possibly be, will be, that could include gods. I mean, it, look, it includes us. But that's not a very satisfactory answer. And there's going to be some problems that this is going to raise. So one of the uh, great examples of this is going to be saying that, listen, if the gods are actually made of atoms, then they're like everything else that is uh, created from atoms. So they're not eternal. And you Epicureans want to say that the gods are eternal and blessed and all these other things. But if you want to have this atomist doctrine, well, you, you just can't have eternity. That is not going to be something possible for you because everything that's made of atoms, the atoms might be eternal, but the compositions of atoms, those aren't going to be eternal. So how are you going to get these things, right? If the gods are made out of atoms, then they came into existence at some time. If they came into existence at some time, then they're not eternal. And you might say, well, once they come into existence, they're in a stable configuration and that remains the case forever. And, you know, Coda can say, no, I mean, anything that is, uh, has a beginning is also going to have an end. And you, Valeus, with respect to the Platonists, you actually said this. So you're not going to get eternal gods. And, you know, an Epicurean could say, uh, okay, fine. But, you know, there's always some gods around. Maybe they don't last forever. So it's not that damning. And then he's going to say, um, here's another big problem. Here's something that doesn't make sense at all. So uh, he, he says that in Epicurus's desire to avoid the assumption of, as he's going to call it, a dense cluster of atoms, which would involve the possibility of destruction and dissipation. He's going to say that the gods don't have a body as such, corpus, right? But something like a body, but not actually a body. And so we translate this as semblance. And there's actually two terms here, Tom Quam and quasi that are being used in this. So that's one way to get out of this immortality problem. It's also a way to explain how human beings get images of the gods in their minds, which is going to be part of the uh, argument from common consent. But this is not particularly helpful, right? So what is this semblance? It's not body, but it's like body. Great. How is it like body? He says, I don't see how you Epicureans can keep a straight face when you say things like this. He says, I could understand what this meant if it related to wax and images or figures of earthenware, but what the hell does a semblance of body mean or a semblance of blood? I can't understand that. Neither can you Epicureans, even though you say these terms and you're basically just repeating what it is that Epicurus himself has said without really understanding it. Uh, a little bit later on, he's going to talk about this again. And he says, I'm aware you may, what you maintain is that the gods possess a certain outward appearance, right? A species, but it has no firmness or solidity, no definite shape or outline. It's free from gross admixture, volatile, transparent. And he says, therefore, we'll use the same language as we would of the Venus of Kos. Hers is not real flesh, but the likeness of flesh. And the mantling brush that dyes her fair cheek is not real blood, but something that counterfeits blood. Similarly, in the God of Epicurus, we'll say it's not real substance, but something that counterfeits substance. And then he says, well, what the hell is that? You know, you can't actually explain this to me. You're just making something up, really. And this is not going to be gods at all. A little bit later, he's going to come up with another interesting question. It's not 
really a takedown or argument. It's more saying, listen, here's another thing I just can't understand. You claim, and this goes back to the atomist thing, you claim that everything is random atoms interacting with no particular design. And you're also going to say that human beings and gods resemble each other. This is another attack that he's going to make in terms of anthropomorphism. And Coda says, it's not really that gods resemble human beings. It's rather that human beings would be resembling the gods. And so he says, um, before the human form existed, uh, the human form existed before mankind, and it was the form of the immortal gods. Um, but if you want to say that, let's assume that there are gods and they do have this, this shape that we have. Great. How the hell did human beings come to resemble them? If there isn't any sort of, you know, design or law or order to nature, why would random atoms being put together in certain ways give us the shape of human beings? And then he's going to return to this question of images a little bit later on. Uh, and he says that, you know, I don't actually understand this doctrine that you, you have here. It says that there's a constant passage or stream of visual presentations which produce a visual impression. I don't understand this. I don't think that you do. How can you prove that the stream of images is continuous or how are the images eternal? You say there's an innumerable supply of atoms. Great. Maybe there are. But that doesn't actually get you a consistent presentation that remains the same all of the time, right? How do you come up with that? He says, how do your pictures of objects arise out of the atoms? Even if the atoms existed, which they don't, they might conceivably be capable, he says, of pushing and jostling one another about by their collision. So randomness is certainly possible. Combination is possible. But they wouldn't create, as he says, form, so formare, uh, figure, figare, uh, color, colare, or life, animare, right? They won't have those effects, you can say. So this is essentially giving reasons why if the Epicureans really want to remain committed to one of their absolutely central doctrines, atomism, physical atomism, everything being built out out of atoms which interact with each other randomly, you can't have gods. You got to pick one or the other and you seem awfully committed to this atomistic philosophy, which probably isn't true either. So you're going to have to give up on your, your portrayal of the gods as Epicurus had sketched it out and as Epicureans are themselves presenting it in the time of this dialogue.